News of the Times, Whitechapel Wednesdays, Part 10. Welcome to our series of Whitechapel Wednesdays. In this weekly series, we cull together news reports in chronological order leading up to the infamous series of slayings. As Ripper enthusiasts will know, there is considerable discussion as to whether the slayings were confirmed only to the five reported. We have included reports outside of the five to show the build-up of terror in the Whitechapel area. We have also included other, sometimes seemingly minor, news stories during this time to give you a picture of the time and life of Whitechapel of 1888, as events build to the series of slayings. In this series, we offer no comment, but adhere strictly to the papers of the time, all in chronological order. We really hope you enjoyed the show. The recap of last week. In last week's episode, the Gateshead murder and the gruesome double event shocks and stands all. Was this a response from the Ripper, from the press reports of his having moved location? We can only speculate. In this episode, more detail and identifications of the victims are investigated. From the Pau Mal Gazette, the 1st of October 1888, more horrors in the East End, two women murdered, the same fearful mutilation. In the early hours of yesterday morning, two more horrible murders were committed in the East End of London the victim in both cases belonging, it is believed, to the same unfortunate class. No doubt seems to be entertained by the police that these terrible crimes were the work of the same fiendish hands which committed the outrages which had already made Whitechapel so painfully notorious. The scenes of the two murders just brought to light are within a quarter of an hour's walk of each other, the earlier discovered crime having been committed in a yard in Burner Street, a thoroughfare out of the commercial road, while the second outrage was perpetrated within the city boundary in Mitre Square in Olgate. In neither case can robbery have been the motive nor can the deed be set down as the outcome of an ordinary street brawl. Both have unquestionably been murders deliberately planned and carried out by the hand of someone who has been no novice to the work, and again it must be added that no reliable clue has yet been obtained. The Burner Street Murder Burner Street is a narrow, badly lighted, but tolerably respectable street, turning out of the commercial road, a short distance down on the right-hand side, going from Oldgate. It is a street mainly consisting of small houses, but which has lately been brightened and embellished by one of the fine new buildings of the London School Board, just opposite this is an international and educational club, domiciled in a private house, standing at the corner of a gateway leading into a yard in which are small manufacturing premises and four small houses occupied by Jewish families. The yard gates are usually closed at night, a wicker affording admission to the lodgers and other residents in the house. The club was on a Saturday evening winding up the Jewish holidays by a lecture on Judaism and Socialism. A discussion followed which carried on the proceedings to about half past twelve and then followed a general jollification accompanied, as the neighbours say, by a noise that would effectively have prevented any cries for help being heard by those around. The mirth, however, was brought to a sudden and dreadful stop. The steward of the club 
who lives in one of the small houses in the yard and had been out with some sort of market cart, returned home just before one Sunday morning he turned into the gateway, when he observed some object lying in his way under the wall of the club. Unable to see clearly what it was, he struck a match and found that it was a woman. He thought at first she was drunk and went into the club, and some of the members went out with him and struck another light, and were horrified to find the woman's head nearly severed from her body and blood streaming down the gutter. The police were summoned, and the poor creature was born to the St. George's dead house. Identification of the Victim The corpse was still warm, and in the opinion of the medical experts who were promptly summoned to the place, the deed of blood must have been done not many minutes before. The probability seems to be that the murderer was interrupted by the arrival of the cart, and that he made his escape unobserved, under the shelter of the darkness which was almost total at the spot. The efforts of the police to trace the murderer have been without result as yet. The body has been identified as that of a woman named Elizabeth Stride, who had been living in a common lodging house in Flower and Dean Street, and had been in the habit of frequenting this neighbourhood, where it appears she was a familiarly known as Long Lizzie. She had a sister living somewhere in Holborn, and her husband, from whom she had been separated for some years, is said to be living at Bath. The body, when found, was quite warm. In one hand was clutched a box of sweets, and at her breast were pinned two dahlias. She was respectably dressed for her class, and appears to have been about thirty-five years of age. Her height is five foot five inches, and her complexion and her hair are dark. She wore a jacket made of dark diagonal cloth, feather trimmings, a black skirt, velveteen bodice, crepe bonnet, side spring boots, and white stockings. Medical men were busy yesterday in minutely examining the body, and this morning about eleven. Mr. Wynne E. Baxter opened an inquest. The woman's movements have been traced up to a certain point. She left her lodgings in Flower and Dean Street between six and seven o'clock on Saturday evening, saying that she was not going to meet anyone in particular. From that hour, there is nothing certain about her up to that time at which her body was found. Lifeless indeed but not otherwise mutilated than by the gash in the throat, which had severed her jugular vein and must have caused instantaneous death. The Mitre Square Murder At the precise moment that the police were gathering about the place of slaughter in Burner Street, another and more horrible shambles was being provided for their inspection scarcely half a mile away. Shortly before two o'clock, Police Constable Watkins, number 88 of the City Police, was going round his beat when, turning his lantern upon the darkest corner of Mitre Square, Oldgate, he saw the body of a woman, apparently lifeless, in a pool of blood. He at once blew his whistle, and several persons being attracted to the spot he dispatched messengers for medical and police aid. Inspector Collard, who was in command at the time of Bishopsgate Police Station, but a short distance off, quickly arrived, followed a few moments after by Mr. G. W. Sikera, surgeon of 35 Jury Street, and Dr. Gordon Brown, the divisional police doctor of Finsbury Circus. Chief Superintendent Major Smith, Superintendent Foster, Inspector McWilliams, 
and Inspector Collard immediately organised a scouting brigade to detect and arrest any suspicious-looking character. But no one was taken into custody. A shocking sight. In the meantime, Dr. Sikera and Dr. Gordon Brown made an examination of the body. The sight was a most shocking one. The woman's throat had been cut from the left side, the knife severing the main artery and other parts of the neck. Blood had flowed freely both from the neck and the body on the pavement. Apparently the weapon had been thrust into the upper part of the abdomen and drawn completely down, ripping open the body, and in addition both thighs had been cut across. The intestines had been torn from the body, some of them lodged in the wound on the right side of the neck. The woman was lying on her back with her head to the southwest corner and her feet towards the carriageway, her clothes being thrown up onto her chest. Both hands were outstretched by her side. Near where she was lying, two or three buttons were picked up and a small cardboard box containing two pawn tickets. The supposition is that her pockets were hastily turned out, either for robbery or to evade suspicion as to the motive for the crime. Dr. Brown, having taken a pencil sketch of the exact position in which the body was found, at three o'clock it was removed to the city mortuary in Golden Lane to await a coroner's inquest. The description of the deceased. The following is the description of the deceased issued by the police authorities with a view to identification. Age, about 40. No rings on fingers. Black cloth jacket. Three large metal buttons down the front. Brown bodice. Dark green chintz dress with Michaelmas daisies and golden lily pattern. Three flounces. Dark linsey skirt. Thin white skirt. White chemise. Brown ribbed stockings, feet mended with white material, and a large white neckerchief round the neck. A pair of men's old lace-up boots, tattoo marks on the right forearm, T.C., and the whole of the clothing being very old. She also wore a black straw bonnet trimmed with black beads. It may be remarked that the police rely principally on the tattoo marks as a means of identification. Recognition almost impossible. For several hours yesterday, Detective Sergeant Actram, accompanied by another officer, was engaged in making inquiries in the lodging houses in and around Spitalfields, his object being principally to trace the antecedents of the victim. The pawnbroker's duplicates found near the body bear the dates of the 31st of August and the 28th of September. The names given on the tickets were Emily Burrell and Jane Kelly, and the addresses Dorset Street and White's Row, Whitechapel, both being fictitious. Yesterday afternoon, Sergeant Outram accompanied two women and a man from a lodging house in Spitalfields to the mortuary, one of the former stating her belief that the victim was a Mrs. Kelly. After carefully scrutinising the features for some time, however, they were unable to give a decided opinion on the matter. It may be mentioned that the tattoo marks on the right arm are slightly obscured from view unless the arm is almost fully exposed, and further that the nose and face are hacked about to such an extent as to render recognition almost impossible. Street Scenes on Sunday On approaching the scene of the murders yesterday morning, it was easy to see no nearer than a mile away, 
that something unusual was in the air. Along all the main thoroughfares a constant stream of passengers, all impelled by the same motive of horrified curiosity, was rolling towards the district. The scanty details which had then transpired were eagerly passed from mouth to mouth. There was but one topic of conversation. The few acres of streets and houses between Mitre Square and Burner Street seemed to be a goal for which all London was making. At the actual places the scene was naturally even more remarkable. The two admits to Mitre Square were blocked by hundreds, and during part of the day thousands of persons struggling for a place where they could look on the fateful spot. A bar of police kept the crowds outside the square, as one of these was heard inquiring, What did they want to see? The body's been taken away long ago, and even the blood was all washed away. However, the barren satisfaction of trying to peer round the fateful corner continued to be enjoyed by long lines of men, women and children going and returning. After a glance at one place, the spectators hurried away to the other. From Commercial Road, Burney Street seemed a sea of heads from end to end. At both places on the fringe of the crowd, the opportunity for business was seized by costers with barrows of nuts and fruit, a shop even being opened for the purpose in Mitre Street. One remarked overhead in Commercial Road was in this strain. Well, it brings some trade down this way anyway. At nightfall the stream ran the other way. There seemed to be an exodus of disreputability from the east. Along two great avenues leading westward, the miserable creatures who apparently had most to fear from the mysterious criminal seemed to be migrating to a safer and better lit quarters of the metropolis. The noisy groups fleeing before the approaching terrors of night were conspicuous among the better-dressed wayfarers in Holborn and the Strand. Matthews and Warren called upon to resign. At three o'clock yesterday afternoon, a meeting of nearly 1,000 persons took place in Victoria Park under the chairmanship of Mr Edward Barrow of the Bethnal Green Road. After several speeches upon the conduct of the Home Secretary and Sir Charles Warren, a resolution was unanimously passed that it was high time both officers should resign and make way for some officers who would leave no stone unturned for the purpose of bringing the murderers to justice instead of allowing them to run riot in a civilised city like London. On Mile End Waste during the day, four meetings of the same kind were held and similar resolutions passed. The Whitechapel Vigilance Committee had addressed the Queen a petition, praying that in the interest of the public at large, Her Majesty will direct an immediate offer of a large reward for the capture of the murderer. The helpless, heedless, useful figure at the Home Office. And where, forsooth, is Mr Matthews all this while? asks the Daily Telegraph. What has Her Majesty's Secretary of State for Home Affairs been doing about these very disquieting Home Affairs? We do not even know whether these regularly repeated assassinations of helpless fallen women have sufficed to bring Mr Matthews up to town, except that the issue of a letter on the subject of offering a reward for the detection of the criminal appears to have proven that our Home Secretary has at least heard of what is happening. Truly, the public generally would like at last to know whether Mr Secretary Matthews still sees nothing in the present case to justify a departure from the rule. Justice personified unhappily just now in the helpless, heedless, useful figure 
of the Right Honourable Henry Matthews ought at length to arouse herself and scour the capital, obliterate the slums, search between the very bricks and mortar in order to unearth this unspeakable villain whose deeds appall a whole kingdom. If it be of no avail, we would once more urge Mr. Matthews to wake up and do his duty. If it be of no avail, then the protest against his ineptitude will assuredly become a clamour, a demand, an insistence, and Lord Salisbury will have to dismiss the minister who has not good sense enough to resign. From the Express and Echo on the 1st of October 1888, the Devon Evening Express. The catalogue of horrors perpetrated in the East End of London was painfully augmented yesterday morning when it was discovered that during the night two women had fallen victim to the fiend who has long since become a terror to the whole neighbourhood. The first body was discovered in a yard in Burner Street, St George, not far from the locality where the last of the four Whitechapel tragedies had been committed. The body was not mutilated, but the head was nearly severed. The second body, which was found about half an hour later in Mitre Square, Houndsditch, was shockingly mutilated. One of the dead women were identified last night, and the police have made one arrest, but the man taken into custody was released this morning. As in the previous cases, the authorities appear to be entirely without a clue. The Central News has telegraphed copies of some extraordinary letters received from an individual signing himself, Jack the Ripper. On behalf of the inhabitants of the East End of London, a petition was forwarded to Her Majesty on Saturday, urging that a reward should be offered for the detection of the murderer or murderers of the four women who up to date have been killed in Whitechapel and expressing the conviction that the offender, if undiscovered, would sooner or later commit other crimes of a like nature. The inadequacy of words was never more widely realised than now, when men find it impossible to express the feelings aroused by the renewal of the Whitechapel murder horrors. The similarity of the circumstances, their loathsome, their frightful completeness, and the apparent powerlessness of the police combined to appall the public imagination. But a state of perpetual panic is an impossibility. If people come to entertain the belief that the recognised resources of the executive are unequal to the work of affording protection, they will resort to the primitive means of individual self-defence. That would give the lie direct to the existence of our boasted civilization, and at the same time to accentuate the prevailing sense of the impotence of the metropolitan police system. Next to the feeling of horror inspired by the butcheries themselves is the indignation everywhere felt that, despite the cost involved in their maintenance, despite their number and the facilities at their disposal, the London police should have failed to run to earth the culprit or culprits concerned in the series of murderous mutilation of which Whitechapel has been the scene. It will be remembered with what fancied consciousness of superiority most of us joined in censoring the French police for their supposed apathy in connection with the murder of Mr O'Neill, a journalist at Boulogne. How it was said upon all hands that, had such an occurrence taken place in this country, our detectives would, within a very few hours, have secured the criminal. This sort of argument, or rather comment, employed to the disparagement of the French police was, not many months since, very common in the pages of English newspapers. 
any egotism upon the score in question has, we think, been pretty well killed out of the country by this time. There is a great deal to be effected before our own house can be said to be approximately in order. The British metropolis requires policemen, not the mechanical instruments of a spurious militarism. Let us hope that the official disgrace already incurred will not be augmented. It is impossible that it should be wholly wiped away. That concludes this episode of Whitechapel Wednesdays, Part 10. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. We upload five times a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays. We review one of the historical serial killers in our large database. Sundays, a new series we are trialling, Eccentric Sundays, where we look into Great Britain's rich history of quirky, odd and eccentric characters. Mondays, an in-depth investigation into a famous story of its day. Tuesdays, at present, a pooled together collection of stories from our database, for example, Murders on Railways and Wednesdays, Whitechapel Wednesdays, where we chronologically go through the newspaper stories related in Whitechapel leading to the series of gruesome crimes in 1888 and arguably beyond. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.